Thank you very much, uh, Irene, um, for that introduction. You'd be glad to know I'm not going to explain to you what the First Civil Service Commissioner does. I mean, it's bad enough having a lecture before dinner like this, um, but for me to go completely off into my own little world, I think, wouldn't be very interesting. Um, I thought I um, would stay very firmly in your world, um, really, um, because one of the side benefits for me of leading the Independent Review um, of the Police Federation um, was that it brought me back into contact with the police service uh, that I'd got to know so well during my um, five years as permanent secretary at the Home Office. It's a police service I had many discussions with and some arguments with about policy and organization and efficiency, um, but which I always admired for its sense of service and for your willingness um, daily to put yourselves at risk to protect the public. You know, some of the best times I had at the Home Office was when I spent time seeing the work of the police close up, close up going on an emergency response, um, which was quite an experience. I'd love to tell you that story, but some other time perhaps, um, with a, an officer from the Met. Um, who had a certain sense of humour, um, <laughs> walking the streets with the neighbourhood policing teams, working alongside the Met and others in the fight against terrorism. Um, I came at those moments to understand better the special nature of British policing, based as it is on public approval and consent. And um, I guess many who have given this lecture have quoted those uh, some of those principles um, that are attributed to Robert Peel, but actually I don't think were drafted by him. Um, uh, but they, those principles were brought home to me by some of those experiences, and a couple of them really resonated with me. One is this one, which is the power of the police to fulfill their functions and duties is dependent on public approval of their existence, actions, and behaviours, and on the ability to secure and maintain public consent. And then, of course, those more memorable words, words that police at all times should maintain a relationship with the public that gives reality to the tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. It's a, it's a great phrase, um, uh, something to hold on to um, as you go through difficult times. What struck me when I led the review of the Police Federation was how much these basic principles seemed under question. And more than that, there seemed to be not many people, including, I have to say, the leadership of the police service, seemingly willing and able to stand up publicly and assert those principles. I don't mean you don't feel them deeply, but it's the public assertion of them that I didn't see. In the report of the Independent Review, we wrote of a perfect storm facing the police. Fundamental reforms of police practice, major changes in the national landscape of policing, changes affecting pay and pensions, and many aspects of police terms and conditions, and all underpaid, pinned, as you know well, by cuts in resources on a huge scale. Um, more than 30,000 jobs lost. At, lost actually, I think it's more than 35,000, um, including well over 15,000 police officers uh, gone and more to come. Uh, we as members of the public sometimes forget, but I'm sure you do not, that almost uniquely these changes affect every police officer in England and Wales, holding down their pay, changing their career expectations, altering their shift patterns, making it harder every day to meet the expectations of the public. During our review, I have to say, we found a high level of anxiety from rank and file police officers, a lot of pressures, which would have tested even a very effective police federation and is testing all representative organisations in the police and creating challenges for police leadership everywhere. But this is only, of course, half the reason for the perfect storm. In parallel, we've seen this series of historic cases which have cast a shadow over the integrity of the police service. And there's a danger that these cases are increasingly the lens through which the police are viewed, to some degree by the public, but certainly by informed opinion, by the media and by politicians above all. 
you know, it was encapsulated for me in the Home Secretary's speech to the Federation Conference. As the Federation representatives will hear, will know, I was there, um, and I'll not easily forget it. Not least because I was speaking shortly after the Home Secretary, hoping to persuade the conference to adopt the recommendations of the independent review. I'd, <laughs> I'd expected to. <laughs> I had, there was lunchtime in between. We had quite an interesting lunch. Um, uh, I had expected to hear her say some critical things about the Federation and to support the independent review report. What was surprising was that she generalised this into a criticism of the police service itself, listing one by one the examples how, of how the police were in danger of losing the support and confidence of the public. A lot of commentators saw the speech simply in political terms. Some police officers wanted to dismiss her examples as isolated incidents. In my view, however, the fact that she felt it necessary to make the speech reflects the extent to which that historic relationship between the peace, police and the public is under question. Past Home Secretaries could not have made that speech and would not have felt the need to do so. They certainly wouldn't have got much public or media support if they had done so. There is, I think, almost certainly a long-term trend taking place with the public generally less willing to trust those in authority and more willing to challenge those who exercise authority. That's affecting the police as much as, every, as any public service. But I believe the litany of cases which the Home Secretary gave make the public more wary of the relationship with the police than they have ever been. As members of the public, we still want to trust you. We still need to turn to you in times of stress and da danger. We still want that historic relationship which the principles of Peel so eloquently described. But there are examples some of them not so long ago, of the police service abusing its power or falling short in protecting uh, the public. We mustn't wake up one day soon and find that we've lost our confidence and trust in the police. It's so vital to the orderly nature of our society and it's precious to our way of life in Britain. I don't have an easy solution to this perfect storm. It would be a more interesting lecture if I did, but it doesn't seem to me to be passing. Indeed, since we wrote the report, the challenges have grown bigger as the resources diminish. Take only the example, of course, of the recent terrorist uh, threat, the putting up of the, uh, the threat level, which poses huge new challenges for the police nationally and in particular communities, and of course requires more police visibility on our streets to offer public reassurance, as well as to protect vulnerable locations and installations. So who's speaking up for the police? There are thousands of examples every day of honest, hard-working police officers going the extra mile to serve the public. Almost every one of you here will have a story of something you personally have done in your career, which you take for granted, but we find remarkable. The job is certainly getting more difficult as the threats grow and the nature of crime changes. The greatest frustration of the rank and file police officers I met during my review was that neither, they felt that neither their own leaders nor the Federation was projecting a view of police officers which adequately reflected the pressure they were under and their own sense of pride in the service they were giving to communities day in and day out. They felt undervalued and underappreciated and oddly, you may think, they were inclined to blame their own leaders and their own federation and not the government. I believe, actually, this is a challenge of a generation for everyone in leadership positions in the police. Whether you are in a leading role in a force, uh, whether you um, uh, uh, in an, oh, sorry, or whether you speak on behalf of the police from a representative organisation. I know that some of the traditional leadership uh, voices in ACPO and in the Federation have for different reasons been weakened in recent year, years, just when they needed to be at their strongest. 
individual chief constables seem to me to be more inhibited in expressing their views about general policing matters, perhaps because of the arrival of police and crime commissioners, perhaps because they're just too busy with the challenges. Nor have the new kids on the block, the police and crime commissioners themselves, nor the College of Policing yet, I think, filled that gap. In my days at the Home Office, a powerful voice for the police would have been the Chief Inspector of Constabulary. But although the present one has made some powerful interventions recently on behalf of the police, there are clearly limits to how far a Chief Inspector who is not a police officer can fill the role um, I am describing. So, my submission is that it's urgent for the leaders of the police service in England and Wales, whoever you are, wherever you are, to start to step up to the plate and start putting the case for the police. It needs almost to be a campaign to restate your commitment to the historic values and ideals of the poli police service and to reconnect the service in everything it says and does to the public. You can't afford to let the arguments go by default, and you can't afford to let others define those arguments. It has to be more than rhetoric, of course. It has to be backed up with real examples of how the police, force by force, are working to build the confidence of the public in the police. It's not a message that can only be given once. It won't be carried in the conventional media. It has to be given time after time until it gets into the public psyche. Members of the public need to be confident that police chiefs and their commissioners are focused on the public's priorities. It's a disgrace that there's such a low uh, turnout in commissioner elections. It's a complete disgrace. They need, uh, the public need the evidence, and I believe it's there, that more crimes are being solved and that criminals are being brought to justice. We need visible policing and guaranteed response times. We need a recording of crime statistics in which we can have confidence. We need the protection of the gains in community confidence which have come from neighbourhood policing. We need the police to be at the forefront of local partnership working, building the community capacity to prevent crime, not just to solve it when it's committed. There's a real dilemma here, isn't there? It is not credible to argue that cuts of 25% or more in police resources double the 12% the last chief inspector thought was feasible are possible without affecting the operational effectiveness of the police and creating the need for, at best, severe prioritization of how resources are deployed. That is just a fact. Unless you are incredibly inefficient, and I don't believe you are, you can't take that level of reductions in resources and it not have some effect. Your response so far has been impressive, with genuine attempts to protect the front line. Some forces have been really innovative in redrawing their services, and in some cases, of course, there are collaborations between forces which look like steps to merger. The Chief Inspector himself has said, in these times of austerity, it's to the credit of the police service that so many forces have shown themselves able to protect the front line and make the necessary savings. But look at his reports in more detail, and you have to feel concerned. Some of the resource cuts are falling on the very services and partnerships which are vital to the connection with the public, which in turn helps to deter and prevent crime. Neighbourhood policing, one of the great achievements of the last 15 years in putting the police service back on the streets into communities, is under particular pressure in some places. Some large metropolitan forces are suffering disproportionately because of the way the funding system cuts their resources disproportionately. Some small forces stretched at the best of times when resources are much more plentiful are now struggling to cope in some respects. I understand that police chiefs and people in this hall cannot take on these resource arguments publicly, not too publicly, because it gets you too close to the political debate. But you can put the positive case for what you are achieving in transferring every ounce of resource to the front line and taking real credit for the improvements um, which are resulting. 
You can show how you have squeezed resources from the back office and support services and show us what else would be possible in reforms to police practice if more resources uh, are available. It is for the rest of us, particularly those who represent the police, to make the case for more resources or at best no more reductions because like the Home Secretary I think said there would be more on the back of the achievements so far. Very much hope the police and crime commissioners will feel able to take the lead in this. I know some will and some won't want to. This is not some crude plea, plea for let's just have more resources. It has to be part though of rebuilding the trust with the public. There's plenty of anecdotal evidence that the public is willing to see more money spent on the police if they think the public really are providing a good value service. So there is the basis for a new deal with the public. First make the case in terms of the quality of service you provide and want to provide. Show us that the ability to respond to the needs of communities is finite. When the public are really convinced once again that the police really are the public and the public are the police, I believe that in many places they will be willing to back more resources, either through na national taxation, but I'd rather doubt that, or as is increasingly likely through the local precept. If this is a system in which it's all in your hands locally, which I think is what the Home Secretary is saying, then local taxation will be the way of finding these resources. And that means you have to con get in touch with the public. This is only part, of course, of what is needed if the bond with the public is to be renewed. Police leaders will have to convince the public that you never will again defend abuse of power and service levels when the public is failed. I don't wholly buy the argument that the cases which the Home Secretary listed in the speech and which have come to the light, have come to light since, are all about the past. I do believe there have been great improvements in policing over 30 years, and that it's wrong to define the quality of policing today by individual cases, however shocking. But my time in the Home Office and the work I did uh, on the independent review still leave me with the feeling that there are elements of the police culture that need to change. That's not easy. It will take a long time. It can't come from politicians. It can come from police leadership. Of course, the culture is partly created by the circumstances in which you operate. To state the obvious, you deal more than most with the bad guys in society. You get accused more than most of the things you have not done for taking wrong decisions when you only had a split second in which to decide. You deal with the roughest end of society, not just criminals, but victims too, who come from an underclass or an underworld which most of us cannot conceive of and fortunately don't experience. You're scrutinized and criticized and held to account by people who you feel don't understand the difficulty of the job you do. It can be tempting for some, fortunately a minority, to misuse powers in the interests of catching the criminal. The danger is that this breeds a culture of defensiveness, a tendency to close up, a resentment and anger, a willingness to tolerate the justification that the end justifies the means. There's nothing, of course, wrong with standing alongside colleagues in adversity or standing together in times of risk. In the right circumstances, those are essential and admirable attributes. It's part of the job of representative organizations like this one to represent members who are accused of wrongdoing. It's natural that you will instinctively leap, leap to colleagues' defense. The problem is that this too often leads to a closing of ranks in the face of clear wrongdoing or to defending the indefensible, or almost as bad, a deafening silence. In the course of my review, I was surprised to say the least at the unwillingness, even from the police chiefs involved, to criticize the actions of the officers who targeted Andrew Mitchell. 
even though there were many rank and file officers around the country who believed it was doing serious damage to the reputation of the police for integrity and impartiality. And the problem with the bullying we encountered in the Federation was not simply the damage it was doing to the Federation, it was that it was carried out by serving police officers. And no one was willing to speak out against it or to deal with it. Leadership in these circumstances really matters. Leadership at all levels. Effective leaders do not simply agree the plans and the strategy and the resources and hold the team to account for performance. They also, most crucially, set the standards and values of their force. Ensure that those standards and values become the guiding principles of the force. Above all, demonstrate those values in their own behavior. Whether you choose the original Peel principles or the latest code of ethics, which is helpful, it needs boiling down to simple principles. Integrity, impartiality, openness, accountability to the public, respect for the law. It's not more complicated than that. Something that's memorable and relevant to everyone in the force can be easily understood and, more important, easily enforced. So my plea is that everyone in leadership positions should put standards and values at the top of your agenda. And I suggest you do it noisily. We need to know that you will never defend actions or behaviors which fall short. We need to hear police leaders being the first to say, whether it's in response to the Home Secretary's speech or to an utterly shocking report like that uh, about child sexual exploitation at Rotherham, these things were wrong. They dishonor policing. We will not defend or excuse them. We are determined to do better. We don't hear that enough. We need to hear it. I have one final ask of police leadership. I think you're a bit further ahead in this, but I'm not, I think, going to court popularity everywhere. And it comes directly from my experience of the independent review. There was just one area of the review in which the recommendations did not reflect the majority view of the members, and that was in the area of diversity. In the polls we did, there was little enthusiasm for positive action to change the balance of the leadership away from its predominantly white male culture, and no real sense that the unrepresentative nature of the Federation in terms of women or ethnic minorities was a problem. I suppose you could say, Sorry about this, uh, Steve, that in this one respect, the Federation reflected the views of its members. But leadership's not a popularity contest, is it? If we want to put at the heart of policing service to the public, public trust and public confidence, if we really believe the police are the public and the public are the police, then it's not sustainable to have a police force anywhere which does not broadly reflect the makeup of the community it serves. It's not about political correctness, although many think it is. It's not about hitting some precise target or giving preference to people who are not good enough. It's more fundamental than that. It's a doubt about a deep commitment to equality, a determination from leadership to attract the best from every community and remove the barriers to them joining and progressing. In truth, it is again about the British model of policing rooted in the public it serves. You'll be glad to know it's almost time for dinner. Um, and I hope I've given you food for thought and not uh, too much cause for indigestion. Some of you in this audience will undoubtedly be saying that th these things do not apply to you. Some of you will have spoken out against low standards and bad behavior. Many of you will constantly be reappraising how you connect with the public and can do it better. This association has done some important work on uh, aspects of diversity and has actually given a lead. But my message is not that there is no progress or that there are not brave leadership voices regularly putting the positive case for policing. It is at present those voices are being drowned out by the negatives. Some of them the result of real failings, some of them based on media and public perceptions. And it is colouring public confidence in policing as a whole. 
I don't believe it can be reversed quickly. It requires a united police leadership, acknowledging the mistakes, visibly upholding the highest standards of conduct and behaviour, and relentlessly putting the positive case for what you do and are achieving in a period of austerity. And you have to go on saying it and doing it because eventually people will believe it and will listen. I've addressed my remarks, of course, to all police leaders, but it applies particularly to members of this association. You two are very much part of the leadership, of course, both in your individual positions and as representatives. You very often occupy the most senior command positions in your force. The Superintendents Association has long been one of the most respected and constructive voices among the representative organisations for the police because of the way you go about putting your case. You do get listened to more than most. You do um, uh, have influence beyond uh, your numbers. So your reputation remains high and therefore your voice can be very powerful. You can't fill the gap by yourselves, but you can be a strong part of the solution. I hope you'll want to be. To all of you, thank you for listening. I've spoken because I really care about the police, and I want this to be the most admired service in the world. I think it can be, but of course it is in your hands. Thank you very much.